people some rules to follow. You know, if we just put up here a big list of rules and regulations, we can have thou shalt not all the way down this wall and thou shalt over on this wall. And that we would make people holy by following the rules. And sometimes the Baptists, we've been accused of that. Only to find out that that's not the goal at all. In our own home, rearing our children, I learned that we could get our children to conform to certain rules. You know, your house all has rules, you know. Don't spit on the floor. Don't, you know, our rules are pretty lax in that way because of their dad. Don't throw your socks in the middle of the floor. I'm still working on that. My wife is, I'm, I'm getting better. We could get conformity on the outside, but the heart is different. You could not get a heart that loves God by making up a bunch of rules. But instead, your life has to change through a personal trust in Jesus as your Savior. Your heart has to change by coming to a point in your life where you've turned from the way you've been living and turned from your sin to follow Jesus. And the ultimate goal in all of this is not to get everybody to go down the list and say, yep, I took a bath today, got that one off. The, I didn't um, uh, wear my, you know, whatever, w my wild tie today. I've got some ties that I don't wear in public. I, somebody gave them to me and I don't have any place to wear them. The goal is found in Galatians 4, verse 19. The thing that God wants to do in your life is not to get you to follow all the rules and regulations, but rather that Christ will be formed in you. Today I want to talk about the purpose of the Holy Spirit in your life. I'm going to talk about the problems with the flesh in your life and the process of Christ being formed in your life. As I look at this, I realize in, in verse 19, the language is a neat word. This is a present or a future temporal um, verb. It means it is in the process of happening. It is an ongoing process. And the word used for form is the Greek word morpho. You go, oh, that tells me a whole lot. It's like a butterfly. You know, and a butterfly climbed into the chrysalis, not the cocoon. I know enough about biology to let you know that. The butterfly, or the caterpillar, climbed into a chrysalis, and inside that chrysalis, something amazing is happening. And eventually, he breaks out, she, whatever it is, breaks out of that chrysalis and becomes a beautiful butterfly. We say that butterfly morphed or caterpillar morphed into a butterfly. In the same way, God is changing you from the inside out to be like Jesus Christ. We are to be morphed into Christ's image. We are to look like and act like and live like our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, the Bible tells us that every situation in life has the purpose of making you to be like Jesus. Once you've trusted in Jesus as your personal Savior, everything that happens in your life is to make you like Christ. Good and bad things. How often, when you're going through a trial, have people quoted Romans 8, 28? All things work together for good to those who are called according to God's purpose. And it doesn't matter how, what kind of misery you're going through. The thought of that verse is, everything just going to be roses and sunshine, and you're going to be okay. And that's not what that verse says. Because you look at it in the context Romans 8, 28, it says, We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. Now, verse 29. For whom He foreknew, He also predestined to be conformed to the image of His Son, that He might be the firstborn among many brethren. Every situation in your life has the purpose of conforming you to be like Jesus. That word conformed is a neat word. 
I worked in a factory. I walked beside and checked parts on a 500-ton press. It was cool if you didn't have to work there. And I won't go any further than that. What happened was that we had a press that would force down with 500 tons at the top of its stroke, just wham, down on this die. You got one side of the die and the other side of the die. We made big wheels, big wheels. And you would push the two buttons, and that press would could form a flat piece of seven gauge steel into the shape of half a tractor wheel. And then you'd go to the weld shop and weld it together. God uses life situations as the die, as the press, if you will, to force you into his mold not to get you to follow all these rules and regulations, but to get you to be like Jesus. That means the happy times in your life, they ought to make us to be like Jesus. The difficult times in our life, the hor horrible times in our life, the tragic times in our lives, God is using that situation to force you into the mold of Jesus Christ. To make you like Jesus. Because God's goal isn't to make you wealthy. His goal in life isn't to make you healthy. His goal in life might be to make you wise. But his goal in life ultimately is to make you like Jesus. You know what's hard? Because I don't always want to be that way. And we'll talk about that in a minute. This morning in our Sunday school class, we discussed 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And verse 18, we ended with this. But we all with an unveiled face, beholding as a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed. Guess what word that is? Morphed. We are being morphed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the Spirit of the Lord. God is morphing us into the image of Jesus Christ. Listen, if you've been saved, according to 1 Corinthians 6.20, you've been saved to reflect Jesus Christ. That means you're to live a life for God. You're to live a life that glorifies God. If you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, something amazing happened. The Holy Spirit came to indwell you. And in that indwelling, the Holy Spirit changed you. And is in the process of changing you. You see, God didn't save you just to leave you like you are. You know, we sing that song, Just as I am without one plea. And sometimes we get it wrong. Because you come to Jesus just as you are. With all of your sin, with all of your hang-ups, with all of your problems. But Jesus does not leave you just as you are. He changes you. 1 John chapter 3 says this. And you know that he, speaking of Jesus, was manifested to take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. That means does not continue a lifestyle of sin. Whoever sins has never seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not go on sinning, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot continue to sin. Because he has been born of God. Now, I've, I've read part of that in the correct um, uh, tense. The King James Version, New King James Version, doesn't quite get the tense right of that passage. But here's the picture. If you are living a lifestyle that is characterized by sin, it is evident that you do not know Jesus Christ as Savior. Because you're still doing the works of the devil. Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil, which is sin. 
That tells me that if I am walking with God, I'm going to deal with sin in my life. Does that mean I'm perfect? Now, my wife thinks I am. i got to let you know. Oh, maybe not. She knows me better than anybody else in this room, and she knows I'm far from it. But it does mean that my goal in life is to be like Jesus. My ultimate desire, I only have one problem in this life. And see, when I get up in the morning, especially when I wash my face and run some water in the four strands of hair that are on top of my head, um, to, to my, kind of paste it out of my face, I meet this individual every morning. I look him eye to eye, face to face. And I, and I tell myself, that's your enemy today. You know, Christians are kind of funny in a lot of ways. We think our big war is against the devil. You know, the devil's out to get me. The devil's hurting me. The devil's creating all kinds of trouble in my life. Or we think the, the, the great problem is the secularist. The one who says, uh, let's separate what you believe from how you live. And, and or we think our, our great war is against the world. And believe me, we, we are fighting the devil. We are fighting the world, but my biggest enemy is that jerk that I look at every morning in the mirror. It's me. You see, the problems I have are with the flesh. And the reason that I do not respond to life like Jesus would is because the flesh that I live with hauls me backwards. It pulls me back into sin. Romans chapter 7 is a picture of that. For we know, in verse 14, the law is spiritual, but I am fleshly, sold under sin. What I am doing, I do not understand. For what I will to do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not to do, I agree with the law that it is good, but now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For the will is present with me. I want to do right, in other words. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the good that I will, I do, I do not do. But the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into a captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am. Who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Here's a war. I carry around in me sin and a fleshly nature. And the things that I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do, those are the things I end up doing. So how am I going to win this victory? And Paul says, thanks be to God that gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We've got all kinds of battles in our life every single day. And we battle ourselves. There's always a pull to do wrong. There is always a pull to put me first and my appetites first and my desires first before God's. There's always a desire to make myself happy at the expense of offending God. And that tells me that every morning I've got a problem with flesh in my life and I need to strap on my Ephesians 6 armor every day and determine I'm going to war.
And I'm not fighting my, you know, I'm hearing a lot of talk. Oh, we got to get people together, get all our guns together and go fight the Muslims. In our, you know what? We need to get our guns together and fight ourselves, our own bodies. Our great war isn't the Muslims. They're lost. This morning we saw in Sunday school, they've got a veil over the word of God. And we need to share Jesus with them. Instead, we need to realize that we go to war every single day. And that my flesh keeps me and prevents me from being the man of God that I want to be. It prevents you from being the man or the woman of God that God wants you to be. I thank God that when I was 12 years old, I didn't live for God all the time, but at 12 years old, I placed my trust in the Lord Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. That tells me I ultimately will win the battle. But until then, I've got a dogfight in front of me. Until then, I've got a problem every single day giving victory to the living God. Sometimes when we deal with sin, we say, well, maybe God can just let that desire go away, you know? Talking to a guy just recently who's struggling with tobacco. They want to quit. Real bad. I think they've quit more times than anybody I've ever known. I think he's quit seven or eight times this year for about two days. And he said, why doesn't God just take that desire from me? That's not how it works, beloved. I know there are people think, and, and some people have that desire taken away. I understand that. But for most of us, it's just a down and dirty fight. Alcohol. Just because you're saved doesn't mean that you won't have a craving to go out and get blasted. God's not going to take that desire from you because he expects you through his word to deal with it. We'll talk about that in a minute. Realize that when I allow my flesh to win, it prevents my spiritual growth. Many of you have heard me talk about Bob Hannes. He, we call him Crosswalk Bob. He walks the streets of this country with a cross on his back, sharing Jesus with whoever he can. And he and I were talking and said, you, you, you'll notice that, I asked him once, you ever get nervous when you talk to people about Christ? And he says, just in my flesh. He says, this flesh gets in the way between people and the cross. I step away from this flesh and let God do it. I don't have any trouble. You know, that's with me. When my flesh gets in the way, man, I don't want to talk to people about Jesus. They're going to think I'm a loony. Okay, worse than they already think I am. This desire to sin will never go away this side of heaven. This desire for the flesh will never go away this side of heaven. One of the great things, you know, Carol this morning was talking about a hotel room. One of the great things about when we finally get home to heaven, this desire to sin is going to be gone. I'll never sin again. Isn't that a blessing? Aren't you excited about that? I will never disappoint my heavenly father ever again when I'm in heaven. But until then, i got to deal with my flesh. And this morning, you made a decision, are you going to follow Jesus or not? Tomorrow morning, guess what? you got the same decision to make. Are you going to follow God, or are you going to do what you want to do? So how does it all work? How do we put it together? Let me share with you a few keys to having victory over the flesh. Keys that will make Jesus to be formed in your life. The first key is that the Holy Spirit always uses the Word of God. Always. I don't know if you're a, a, a Bible reader or not. I, I talk to people, well, I don't have time to read my Bible. And I just ask one question, how many TV shows do you watch a day? We'll sit there for four or five or six hours, drool coming out of our mouth, watching some of the, the, the worst stuff in the world, right? 
And you can't spend 15 minutes letting God talk to you? You're not too busy. You're either too lazy or too unconcerned. You see, God uses the Word of God. The Holy Spirit doesn't just go, bam, you're, you're free of sin. The Holy Spirit takes the Word of God. Well, let me take you to John 15 for a minute. That way you know I'm not just making it up. I'm getting it out of the book. John 14, verse 26. I wrote down John 15. I told Carol, if I don't write it down, I'll forget the verse. Well, I wrote down the wrong chapter. John 14, verse 26. Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit. He said, but the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Here's what happens. If I'm in the Word of God, say today I read Proverbs, and I read that a choice word is like apples of gold in a picture of silver. But somebody did something to make me mad. And I say, oh, yeah, you know, and I say something that is not like apples of gold in pictures of silver. It's more like rotten apples thrown into a junk pile. Here's what happens. Because I've been in the Word of God today. The Holy Spirit says, apples of gold like pictures in silver. And that word you said was not like an apple of gold, was it? And I come to God and I say, Lord, I was wrong. I've sinned. And I confess it next time. So the next time I'm reading the book of James and it says the tongue is the hardest animal to tame. And I read all about the tongue. And sure enough, my tongue gets away with me again. My mouth gets engaged before my brain gets put in gear. And the Holy Spirit brings James to mind. Three and I have to go to God and say, Lord, i got to change the way I'm talking. Well, that can't happen if you're not in the Word of God. The Holy Spirit uses the Word of God to speak to you when you're doing well and when you're doing wrong. The Holy Spirit speaks to you when you are not reflecting the image of Christ, but rather you're letting your flesh run. First, be in the Word of God. Every day, I'm, I'm convinced every day I ought to start with the Word of God, even if it's one verse, to meditate on the whole day. We can make all kinds of excuses not to be in the Word, but they are just that, excuses. You know what an excuse is, don't you? That's a reason that's wrapped up in a lie. In other words, that's not the real reason. I just got an excuse. My real reason is I'm not interested. Second, reckon that sin no longer has dominion over you. Look at Romans chapter 6 with me. Romans chapter 6. Likewise you also, verse 11, likewise you also reckon yourselves to, the, to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in its lusts. Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under law, but under grace. Realize that you are no longer under the law, you're no longer under the flesh. There was a time in my life that if a certain situation happened, I would say in my mind, here we go again. And my reaction to whatever that situation was, was far from godly. In fact, I felt powerless to control my temper. I was a slave to it. I couldn't do anything. I, I, I'd sit there and say, I can't do it. And then I came to realize that my flesh died on the cross with Jesus. 
sin no longer calls the shots for me. It is no longer my sovereign. And it's like, picture yourself in a kingdom. And there has been a takeover of that kingdom. Instead of the king you once served serving, you now have a new king. And as you're walking through the palace, the former king says, Hey, boy, come here, shine my shoes. You know what you can tell that former king? You take a hike. There's a moat. Go jump in it, right? Here's the case. I was under the dominion of Satan and my flesh ruled my life. But then I trusted in Jesus as my Savior. He became my king. And the flesh still calls. Hey, boy, come here. Get this mud off my shoes. Shine them. You know what I can tell my flesh? You're not calling the shots in my life anymore. Jesus is. You hit the road. You have the ability to say no to the flesh. Along with that ability, you have an escape hatch waiting for you. Look, look at 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13, and this is another key. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I need to be in the Word. I need to realize that sin is no longer my master. Thirdly, I need to see that God has a way to escape. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you except as is common to men. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but will with the temptation, or but with the temptation will also make the way to escape that you may be able to bear it. Isn't that a great promise? We have a sign over here. I don't know why that sign, that, that door and not that door. It says exit. I can just see if we had a fire, everybody going to that one door. It's a way out, right? I tend, when I get into a public gathering in a building, I know it's weird. I look for exit signs. Okay, I always think of the worst case scenario. scenario. If we got a fire, guess who's going to beat everybody to that exit sign? <laughs> Maybe not. I might try to help some people get out if I'm following Jesus. When you are tempted by sin and you think your only recourse is to follow the temptation, let your flesh rule your life, start looking. There's an escape hatch. There's an exit door. Your exit may be to turn and walk away. I have not had a, a drink of alcohol since 1974. Some of you aren't even that old. Not that many years ago, I was in a restaurant and stopped to talk to somebody. And my particular vice was whiskey. I loved whiskey. Whiskey. Okay. You go, oh, that's nasty. This guy was sitting at a table and had a shot right in front of him. I wasn't judging him, but I'm sitting there and I could smell it. And you know what I ended up doing? Say, hey, I'd like to talk to you, but I got to leave. Because I wanted one, too. And I haven't had a drink since. And this has only been like three years ago. You know what my escape route was? to turn on my heel and walk away. And I'm sure this guy thought it was rude. I talked to him later and said, listen, I just can't, I, I don't know why, but that day it was hitting me, a lot of things hitting me, and I, that day it just smelled really good to me. I had to turn and walk away. Because if I didn't, I'd been crawled inside that bottle and wouldn't have, be out yet. Here's what I'm saying. You each are tempted in different ways. It may be your pride that is your temptation. It, I start listening, and, and sure enough, I'll miss the one that's hitting you. go, Phew, I got off. <laughs> I'm not going to listen to them. And you think you have no other recourse. God has an escape route for you. 
you can walk out the door. He's got a way to get out of the temptation. Maybe your temptation, here I'm doing it, said I wouldn't do it, now I'm doing it, I'm lying to you. Worry. There's an escape route. Anger. There's an escape route. Lust. There's an escape route. There is a door to escape. So, we spend time in the Word. We realize that sin is no longer our master. We look for the escape route. Third. Fourth. Fourth. You need to put to death your fleshly desires. Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. Colossians 3, 5. In verse 1 it says, If you're raised with Christ, seek those things which are above. Verse 5 says, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth. I love the old King James version of this, by the way. Therefore mortify those desires. I like that word mortify. Put to death is easier for me to understand. You need to kill those fleshly desires. You need to kill them right now. Romans 8, verse 13 and 14 says, If you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Here's how you kill your fleshly desires. You kill them by letting God lead your life. In other words, you starve them to death. You allow God to take control of your life. You say, Lord, wherever you want me to be, whatever you want me to do, I'll go there. Fear is a sin because it's the opposite of faith. Sitting on Main Street in Sturgis, South Dakota, half a block from a clubhouse of a renowned motorcycle, 1% motorcycle club. God spoke to my heart. They need some tracks. Every year I've been there and every year I've tried to give them tracks. This year I, I fought it. I said, they don't want any anyway. Why do I want to do that? You know, that's what's going on in my mind. I don't want to walk that half block and do it. And God's speaking to me. You know what I had to do to the flesh? I had to kill it. I reached in my pocket and grabbed my handful of tracks. I carry mostly tracks in this pocket. Unless I'm really going to a place with a lot of people, then I go both pockets. Got po tracks in both pockets. Reached in my pocket and grabbed a Satan sucks track, held it in my hand, and walked up. You don't get in the clubhouse. You just get to the entrance. Walked up. There were a bunch of guys standing around. I started talking to them. And I thought, I'll talk about their motorcycles because they got cool bikes. Wasn't long. My fear said, now just leave. Don't just leave. I had the tracks in my hand. They're looking down and says, oh, guys, there's something I'd like you to read when you get a chance. Put it in their hand. Fight in my flesh every minute. But you know what happened? When I did that, the flesh backed down. I spent the rest of the day, I had two pockets full of tracks that disappeared. I went back to my bike and got more. Because when we put to death the flesh by obeying the Spirit, we starve out the flesh. Do you want your sinful nation, nature to be weak and sickly and almost powerless in your life? Starve it by doing what God wants you to do. Fifth, realize that there is always an ability to either serve Jesus Christ or make provision of the flesh and make no provision of the flesh. Uh, Romans 13, verse 13 says, Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. 
That's the heart of those who don't want to serve God. But, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Make no provision for the flesh. Bring yourself to a point where you say, I'll never go back. I've got a friend who's an alcoholic. And he, oh, how do I get over this? Well, he doesn't know Jesus. So he's out of the first step. But you know what he, he does? He's got one Texas fifth and one regular fifth of whiskey in his house. Last time I talked to him, he says, here's what we can do. If you, you really want to quit drinking, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Come with me to the cupboard. And I know where he keeps his other in the bedroom. says, let's grab that whiskey and dump it down the drain. Can't do that. No, no, can't do that. As far as I know, he still has that problem with alcohol. Because he has made provision for the flesh over and over again. And I do that with my sin as well. It makes me so angry. I keep my little pet sin and I kind of put him on a shelf where I can get him out every once in a while. And you do too. You want victory over sin in your life? You want to be like Jesus? You want to be formed in his image? The key is don't make provision for the flesh. Do not give Satan opportunity to use your temptation against you. Because our goal isn't to stop sinning. Our goal is to be like Jesus. Our goal isn't to keep the rules and the regulations. Our goal is that Jesus may be formed in me. That I might be changed to be like him. That means you need to be in the word of God. How, how can you know Jesus if you don't know the word? It's as simple as that. I've got a whole other sermon I can preach right now. It means you need to realize sin no longer is your master. You don't have to do what it says. You can say no. To look for the escape hatch. The exit door. To stop give he, feeding your sinful desires and to starve them. And to make no provision for the flesh. To shut the door and say, I'm not going back there again. This morning, my goal for each of you is for you to be like Jesus. That goal is you, for you and I both to follow him. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I've never personally trusted in Jesus as my Savior. I don't even know what you're talking about. I would love to introduce you to Jesus today and tell you how you can know for sure. It would be my joy. The other area is I want to see you have victory over sin. I want to see Jesus formed in you. Let's pray. Father, we want to be like Jesus. We want him to be formed in us. That means we need to say no to our flesh. Father, help us to do that. Father, if there's someone here without Christ, draw them to him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. For our invitation, we'd like to sing number 376 in your hymnal. I have decided to follow Jesus. Perhaps you are here and you're not sure you're saved. I'd invite you to come and somebody will take the Bible and show you how you can know for sure you're going to heaven. Or maybe you're